Hello, good afternoon. It is Tuesday, the 8th of February. It's just a little bit after 2 o'clock. And today's topic is the Atlantic slave trade. Now, it's important to know that slavery has existed since antiquity. Uh, slavery is present as far back as ancient Samaria. It's found in ancient Egypt, throughout the Bible, and even in ancient Greek and Roman times. Uh, Spartacus may be the most famous slave in history. He's the guy who led a slave revolt against the Roman Republic in the year 73 BC. Uh, this early slavery, it's rarely, if ever, based on race. In fact, race, as we think about it, is actually a fairly recent social construct. Um, up until the early 1900s, race was where you were from, not the color of your skin. Uh, the English Domesday Book was commissioned in 1085 by William the Conqueror as a population survey so that he knew how to raise taxes to pay for his army. Uh, the Domesday Book surveyed all the wealth and assets of his subjects and the results of the Domesday Book revealed that more than 10% of all the English population in the year 1086 were slaves. Now we also like to think that slavery disappeared in medieval Europe, especially since we never really talk about it, but slavery remained in southern Europe, Russia, and many other places much longer than we like to admit. For example, uh, Sicily, which is right off the coast of Italy, had slavery through the end of the 1500s. France didn't outlaw slavery until 1831. And while Russian slavery technically ended in the 1720s, the idea of serfdom continued all the way up until 1906. Now what we think of as slavery is called chattel slavery, and that's not going to come into existence until the early 1500s when Europeans bring slaves to the Americas. Now, slavery in Africa looked very different from what we think of as slavery today. It was made up of debt slavery, military slavery, prostitution slavery, uh, criminal slavery, and slavery of war captives. Uh, there was some plantation style slavery, but it was extremely limited and it was very minor. Uh, most African slavery re revolved around the idea of domestic service. And in this system, the slave would work around the house and family of the master, but they would still have some freedoms. Uh, these slaves, they were allowed to own profits. Uh, they could marry. And they could also pass on property or wealth to their children. Also, their children were considered free and not slaves. These African slaves had legal protections, could sue, they could be sued, and once they were freed from their slavery bondage, they could integrate and join their society that they were a slave to. There are some slaves who were treated as collateral to repay debts. Uh, someone who owed a debt would perform work to pay the debt off or give the person they owe the debt to a child in exchange for release from their debt. Slave soldiers were forced to fight for their masters against their will. And there were even some people taken as slaves and then used for human sacrifice. So there were many, many, many different types of slavery found in Africa. Now, while we often think of the European slave trade, there is an older slave trade that was run by Islamic empires. As early as the first century AD, there is talk found in Greek sources of Arab traders sending slaves from Africa to Muslim communities throughout Asia. Uh, these initial slaves were very often used on date plantations, and eventually slavery also spreads to places like India and China. 
our best guess right now, uh, somewhere around 12 and a half million Africans were sent into slavery for Asian or the Islamic slave trade. There was always a preference for female slaves as well as young boys because they were able to have children and were able to work for the longest period of time. So slavery is not just a new world issue. Now, the modern phenomenon of plantation slavery originated with the Native Americans. As we've read, Spanish and Portuguese planters often exploited the Indian labor against their will. I mean, think back to the uh, Bartolomeo uh, de la Casas reading. Uh, eventually, most of the Indians uh, or, or indigenous people who were not used to the heavy work they were being required to do, they ended up dying of disease or they were worked to death. They just weren't used to the, the type of work being asked of them. It's about a 90% death rate. There's not enough people and they were enslaved in their own homelands. So if they were to run away, they could blend in. Sugar is going to be a big reason slaves are brought into the new world. There's a decline in the production of honey. There's this need for a large scale industry and sugar is going to become that large scale industry. Um, you have to extract the sugar from the cane. It takes agricultural know-how. It takes industrial know-how. Uh, it takes a lot of money, it takes a lot of land, and then it takes a lot of labor. Now it's also important to know that there was a period of white servitude that existed between the slavery of indigenous North Americans or Native Americans and African slavery. And these people were known as indentured servants. Uh, indentured servants were contracted for labor in return for free passage to the New World. Sometimes they're convicts from places like England or Scotland or Ireland. They're seen as these undesirable populations. Or they're redemptioners who are people who made arrangements to pay for their passage to the New World. But something happens and they don't have the money when they arrive and they end up having to work off their debts. Now, it is true white servitude for the most part was voluntary, but it was extremely corrupt. The voluntary service could often be the result of forced contracts or kidnappings. And in many ways, these white slaves were then replaced by black slaves because once the white servitude contract was done, the labor was gone as well. And these servants would then become competition once they're free. So African slave labor is tied directly to the rise of sugar and a need to control the source of labor, the failure of indigenous slavery, and then the inadequacy of white labor. So there's three different reasons that African slave labor is going to become the the choice. Now why Africa and not Asia? Um, it has complete, um, it's completely because of geography. That's the best way to put it. Uh, it's a relatively short ride on a boat across the Atlantic Ocean. You only have to cross one ocean instead of two. It also has to do with the fact that the existing slavery system in Africa was easily tapped into by Europeans, especially the Portuguese. Now, very often these Europeans would set up these trading posts. They would make contact with 
African leaders or African middlemen, and then they would exchange European goods and luxuries in exchange for African slaves. The Middle Passage is the name that's given to the process of taking slaves from Africa to the New World. Very often the slaves are taken to the coastal markets in what were known as coffles. Uh, they're st strapped together or tied together. As these coffles move through the territory, um, more people are picked up or some are sold to interior markets along the way. These slaves were required to carry just enough provisions that they could get to the coast. And then when they actually get there, the people are inspected. Try to think of a better way to put that, but they're inspected. The people were inspected by the surgeon of the slave ship. The slave ship surgeon would carefully examine every bit of their anatomy. And those that were found to be worth selling were then branded with an iron on the breast or the shoulder or somewhere else on their body with a mark of the trading company that was selling them. After they leave one of the 20 principal slave ports, they're shipped across the Atlantic Ocean. And here you can see where the major destinations were. Brazil and the Portuguese Empire get the majority of the slaves. The British Caribbean gets the second most. And then while some slaves do come to North America, in reality it's only about 4%. But there are millions of people who are going to be taken across the Atlantic Ocean between 1450 and 1890. Now these people who are doing the transporting, there are two different types of transport that they do. <clears throat> there's this idea called loose packing and there's this idea called tight packing. Those that were doing loose packing they came up with the idea that it was better to have fewer slaves on the ship because more were likely to survive and then those that survived would be in better conditions and therefore the slave trader would make more money. Tight packers they put as many people on the ship as they possibly could and they preferred quantity over quality. They knew that the slaves on their ships would be less healthy, but the idea was just sheer numbers of people you could sell would overcome the amount of disease or death that might happen while the ship was traveling. Here's an example of a coffle caravan going to the coast. Here you can see that the people are chained together. They're tied together. Uh, the small children are tied to the adults and they are marched to the sea with all their emergency provisions with them. This is an example of a slave ship and you can see all the people are depicted as laying down 
and that was because they wanted to get as many people on the ship as possible. This is probably an example of a tight packing captain. Now when the people get to wherever they're going, a lot of things happen. Um, all the men, or I should say all the slaves are taken on board the ship. The men are shackled together two by two. The right wrist and ankle of one to the right wrist and ankle of another. They're sent to the hold of the ship. The hold of the ship is usually about five feet high. Women and children are allowed to roam freely. Generally, there's lots of disease. There's lots of filth, malnourishment. And those that are sick are kept in the hold with others who were not sick. Now, the last two or three days of the Middle pas Passage, they're a pretty happy time for the slaves, comparatively speaking. All the slaves might be released from their irons, few troublemakers kept in the hold for safekeeping. Any remaining food is going to be given out to the slaves. They'll get slightly larger meals. They'll get as much water as they can drink to hopefully make them a little healthier and make them worth more money. After the ship is docked in the Americas, the captain rows ashore to make arrangements to sell his cargo. In some instances, it's fairly rare. The whole cargo is sold to a single planter or maybe a group of planters. More often than not, a slave dealer takes charge of the sale for about a 15% commission and maybe 5% more on the profits. Sometimes the captain himself will sell the slaves, and if that happens, he takes them ashore marches them through the town before taking them to buyers in the public square where they're then sold at auction. Now the most common method of selling a cargo was a combination of the scramble and the public auction. Uh, first the captain went over the cargo and picked out the sick, the maimed, the diseased. Those slaves were taken to a designated tavern where they're auctioned off with a candle because then you can't see their condition as easily. Uh, bids were received until an inch of the candle remained and then their price was usually no more than five or six dollars a head, some being sold for as little as a dollar. Those who were not sold were then left to die on the docks without food and water. The healthy slaves are sold by scramble and that is uh, standard prices for each man, woman, and child. These prices are agreed upon with the purchasers who then scramble for their pick of the slaves. Now experienced planters know what they're wanting and know what they're looking for. Uh, these experienced planters, the buyers, will examine the teeth, the body, they'll decide whether the slave is of good stock or not. Um, muscles are inspected. Women are checked for full breasts and large hips. Uh, that was a sign of good breathing, I'm sorry, breeding. And then some slaves were even required to run and jump. Children, who usually had the run of the ship, could easily pass those tests, but the men had a harder time doing the running and jumping test because they had been held, shackled underneath the deck. We also have something called the triangular trade. The triangular trade linked the Americas, Europe, and Africa together through, a, through this intense commercial system. So slaves were purchased in Africa, they're taken to the Caribbean. They were traded for sugar, which was then taken to either the Americas or to Europe. And then American or European merchants who needed sugar to create rum, purchased the sugar with rum. The rum was then taken back to Africa, given to African slave traders, and that was used to pay for the purchase of more slaves. The slave trade furnished slaves for large plantations in the American South. Um, it helped build the agrarian society that you find in the American South. And this society produced large amounts of staple crops like rice, tobacco, and cotton, which were then shipped all over the world. And there's a 
illustration from 1752 that explains kind of what the impression of the triangular trade was. So slaves go to the New World, sugar goes to the English colonies, and then rum comes back to Africa. There are really big differences on how many slaves were brought to the New World. And that comes from the different research experiences of different historians. Philip Curtin is very well known. He's fairly conservative. He says nine and a half million people came to the New World on top of the other 12 million that went to Asia. Paul Lovejoy, who I've I've read some of his work before. He's closer to 12 million. The historian David Eltis, 12 and a half million. And another historian who I've read a little bit of work by, Joseph Inakori, uh, he puts it at 13 and a half, almost 14 million. Now, no matter how good the research has been, it's very likely that we are undercounting these are just the numbers that have been uncovered from the one of the official 20 slave ports, but there were an untold number of unofficial slave ports or just private people who snuck onto land, made a deal, and then left again. Now the impacts, what were the impacts of this? Number one, huge loss of population, a huge gender disparity. There were much more women than men left in Africa. This population declines because there's a shortage of males to, in, to encourage population growth. Uh, slaves are left with a sense of identity lost. They're taken away from their homelands, they're taken away from their families, and they're taken away from their cultures. Um, death, destruction, famine, warfare, all of that is a result of this African slave trade. All right. Now, for this week, all you have to do is the, the chapter quiz. There is one primary source reading I want you to read, and it's called An Account of the Slave Trade by a guy named Alexander Falconbridge. He was on board a slave trading ship, and he tells his story. There is another article. It's called The Narrative of Aluda Aquino. It's optional. It's the entire book. It's 120 pages, and I'm not going to make you read that for a class assignment. But if you get bored or if you're just interested in knowing more, I do recommend or encourage reading it or at least reading part of it because it is the semi-true story of a slave who was held by the British. Beyond that, to answer your discussion questions from this week, You have to look at the at the chapter, so you need to read the book chapter. And then there are a couple of videos this week I would like you to, to watch to help you read these discussion questions, and they're very good. I mean, one of the, the videos is put together by Steven Spielberg. It is 45 minutes, but it's really good. It's about the Middle Passage. And then there's another one about Crash Course, um, the Crash Course U.S. History episode on slavery. And then another short video called History Summarized Africa. I really feel between reading the Al Alexander Falconbridge article, watching those three videos, watching this lecture, and then reading the book, you'll have a pretty good idea of what happened during the African slave trade. 
And as always, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, just let me know. Uh, email me and I will do my best to get back to you as quickly as I can. All right, I appreciate you for, for watching this. If you have any comments on how I can make these videos better, let me know. And we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.